Loring from Broadway World Raleigh, and I am sitting with Ira David Wood, um, better known around this time of the year as Scrooge. Um, been playing Scrooge a long time, and we're going to talk about that um, in a few minutes. But um, I read that in high school, you were a future farmer of America. So how do you go from that to being in the first class of the North Carolina School of the Arts? A guidance counselor who came up to me and said, uh, you belong with other crazy people like yourself. And I said, where might that be? And he said, the governor's school of North Carolina, um, you have to audition to get in. There were two books in our school library, two theater books. I took them both, called a uh, audition piece from two plays combined into one. I went to Greenville, North Carolina. I auditioned for governor's school. I got in. And while I was at governor's school, this Italian gentleman came and spoke to us. His name was Vittorio Giannini. And he was the first chancellor of this brand new school that was getting ready to open in Winston-Salem, the North Carolina School of the Arts. It was the first school of its kind in the Western Hemisphere that taught music, dance, drama, and academics under the same roof. But hearing that man talk, I would have followed him anywhere. He was wonderful. And his message was that young people who had a talent for the arts needed to be around other young people who shared their same love and passion. Because Helen Hayes once said, we lose so much of our talent early on because they can't make it through that very difficult period where you're getting a lot of flack from your peers because you'd rather practice uh, the piano than football. So, and I went through that. My, both of my children uh, went through that. Uh, but anyway, I uh, aud auditioned for School of the Arts um, with the same audition pieces. And I was sitting in a vocational agriculture class when the principal came on the speaker and he said, Ira David would come to the office. And right away, I was trying to figure out what he knew I had done. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I uh, walked down this long corridor in our school and my mother was standing at the far end and I thought, oh man, this is bad. I got down there to her and I looked at her and I said, mom, what's wrong? And she said, nothing. You've been accepted at the North Carolina School of the Arts. This is the last time I'll see you come down this hallway. So I went back to vocational agriculture, I sat down in my best friend was next to me and he said what happened and I said I've been accepted at the North Carolina School of the Arts and he said what's that and I said I don't know <laughs> but it's going to be better than vocational agriculture so um, that's how that came about but I say this in all honesty I have quoted my vocational agriculture teacher more than I've quoted Shakespeare in my 50 some years in this business he taught us that you can take so much out of the soil, but unless and until you put something back, the soil becomes depleted and no new life will grow. So when people ask me why I've stayed in North Carolina, why I've chosen Raleigh, that's my answer, is I, I think it's so important that we put something back. Otherwise, a lot of the talent that this state produces leaves because we're taught, you have to go to New York or LA, or, you know, somewhere bigger and better. Um, but I've, I've stayed in Raleigh, I've had a wonderful career here. I've been able to do movies and television and, and stage work. Uh, so it can be done. And, and both of my children, my oldest children started here, same thing, and they're doing very well now. So uh, it can be done, and that's a message for a lot of young people. Because one of the few things an artist can decide is where they're going to take a stand. And uh, I said Raleigh is important in North Carolina because the legislature is here. The Arts Council is here. Uh, the legislature who appropriates the money. Very important that they can come and see good theater. And boy do we have it in this area. Uh, when I first came to Raleigh, there were six or eight theaters. Now we have around 70. 
So that really is a renaissance when you think of it in those terms. Very exciting. Well, and that kind of leads me into my next question. You and Raleigh Little Theater and Theater in the Park, you guys were pretty much the first. And how have you, since being with Theater in the Park, founding Theater in the Park, how have you seen the theater community here evolve and grow? Well, the numbers have certainly increased, uh, which is exciting. When I first came to Raleigh and Theater in the Park uh, was founded and we started working, uh, there was a great divide between other theater groups. If you worked at Raleigh Little Theater, you didn't cross the street to come to Theater in the Park. It was very polarized, and that's gone now. Uh, and our talent is free to move around and to work in 70 different theaters, theater companies, if they choose to, and that only makes the talent pool stronger and better. In one sense, uh, I, I think we've gotten to a point now, though, where we have almost too many theater companies in the area. And I say that because it stretches the talent pool very thin. Um, very few people want to take acting classes anymore. And you say, well, you know, you need to learn to breathe, you need to learn something about theater history. But because there are so many companies around, they're dragging people off the street going, you want to be Hamlet? Great. <laughs> so there they are. And, uh, you know, so the response is, well, why should I take a class? I'm playing Hamlet at the Pineapple Theater Company, you know. So, it, but it is important to go back and get that grounding. I had to go to school for five years to learn how to breathe properly and to learn how not to say theater. Because <laughs> I did come from Eastern North Carolina. <laughs> And then this building, very much like Raleigh Little Theater, was a WPA. There, you know, there's historical back right on the. Yes. I, I love historical buildings. Um, tell me a little bit about this space, which is now named for you. Yeah, yeah. better than a gold watch. <laughs> um, the school, uh, the first theater at the School of the Arts was a gymnasium, painted black because the School of the Arts was placed at the old James A. Gray High School in Winston-Salem, set off on a hill, so we were all off by ourselves in a very blighted neighborhood, I might add. <laughs> but um, it was a theater, a, a gymnasium, painted black, floor, ceiling, and walls. Everything was movable inside, a black box. So when I first walked into this building, I looked around, I didn't see a gym, I didn't see a city center, I didn't see a dog obedience school or <laughs> astronomy classes. I saw a theater. And uh, we pushed very hard to get the building. In fact, Frank Evans, who was head of Parks and Recreation at the time, threatened to have me arrested for trespassing once <laughs> because I was pushing so hard because I saw what this could be. Um, and now, you know, we're, we're a theater in Pullen Park, which is the oldest park around, and uh, you know, we're very proud of that fact. And um, I'm just very humbled and honored that uh, the city uh, named it for me. And um, uh, so I'm I'm still here after you know a lot of years. <laughs> and uh, I did have it was that was interesting too when I graduated from School of the Arts. I had an invitation from Andy Griffith to come to the West Coast and be on a series th there that he was doing at the time, which was called Headmaster. And so I was spending the summer in Raleigh, uh, waiting to, to head out in the uh, uh, early fall. And I got a telephone call from the Department of Public Instruction, and they said, I'm, a voice told me, said, I'm looking for a young man who wants to change the world and thinks theater is the way to do it. And that sold me. I, I said I need to call Andy and, and thank him. Uh, and I did. I called Andy and uh, told him I needed to stay in Raleigh because I thought it was very important. Again. So that's what I did for a little over a year. And then I was offered the job here as uh, executive director. And we were the children's theater of Raleigh when I took over. So I said, okay, 
I'll take the job, but I, um, I want to change the whole scope. I want it to be a family theater, so it's not just a babysitting service, because that's really what it had gotten to be. So we, uh, annual attendance was about six to 8,000 a year, and the first year I took over and we expanded the scope, we jumped from between 18 to 20,000 in one year. We started Shakespeare uh, again in Raleigh, and uh, um, I wanted to do Hamlet uh, in modern dress at the Rose Garden Amphitheater, and we were told in no uncertain terms that Raleigh would not cross the road to see Shakespeare. And we played to around 18,000 people for that one performance. The next year we did Richard III, and we played to 18,000 people on opening night. So, I mean, it grew incredibly in just a few years. There is an appetite and appreciation for Shakespeare. and we, We're so happy that we could kick that off, and now we look around and see these Shakespearean productions going on, and it's, uh, it's a good feeling. So in 1974, you did the first production here of A Christmas Carol, um, and you started as Scrooge, and you're still Scrooge. <laughs> um, less makeup. <laughs> less makeup. Did you ever imagine 40-something years ago when you did that performance for the first time that you'd be doing it now, 40 years later, and that it would become really a time-honored seasonal tradition for so many families here in the Triangle. I had an idea that it was going to go on uh, because when we opened in 74, all the other theaters in town were closed. They closed for the holidays. And I knew families over the holidays are looking for something to do. So I said, well, let's do a family show over the holidays. And we we had done uh, Romeo and Juliet, we had done Taming of the Shrew, and of course Shakespeare had not penned a Christmas show, so we went to the second best uh, English author, Charles Dickens, and I said, well, let's do a version of A Christmas Carol. And J.K. Farrell, Terry Mann, and I started working on it, and uh, we basically pulled everything from the book. I think people would be surprised to see or to, to learn that the majority of the script is right out of Dickens' book. Uh, we've updated it. We do some, you know, political humor, some contemporary jokes, and um, and that's to keep people, particularly the the men in the audience, <laughs> engaged. You know. Uh, we have uh, a level of humor for adults and then a level of humor for the littles. That's my name for the children. I call them littles. <laughs> when you grow up, you get to be a biggle. <laughs> so I've called them biggles and littles for uh, 44 years. Um, and uh, for instance, uh, in Act Two, I wanted to give Scrooge a teddy bear so that the littles in the audience could identify with him. He's just a big kid grown up. <laughs> um, I wanted Christmas Future not to be scary like he was in the book. I didn't want to scare the littles. So he comes out, I mean, we have the big Skeletor that makes an entrance, but then he opens up and this very befuddled Undertaker comes out mm -hmm. and he's our Christmas Future. And um, he's got the toughest job in the play because I've often said to whoever's playing the role, there's nothing funny about death and you're gonna make people laugh at death. Um, and we've had to, we've had a lot of success with it. We keep changing it and uh, honing it. Uh, Greg Moore is playing it this year. He's gonna be wonderful. Um, David Henderson, my Jacob Marley, has been on stage with that man. It's like sitting down to a seven course meal. David Moore as Bob Cratchit is wonderful. And then my son Ira will uh, do, we'll do half and half this year. I'll do three per performances here in Raleigh. He'll do three. I'll do three in Durham, and he'll do three there. Well, and, and, and let's talk about that for a second. So you share this role with your son, and you have for a couple, couple of years now. Um, did you give him any advice about stepping into Scrooge's uh, shoes? Well, he took over in 2010 for me when I had open heart surgery. And I basically said, don't try to change too much your first 
time out. The role will eventually be yours because I will retire and you can take over. And then you can change it and make it yours. I said, but I think people are going to come seeing if you can cut the mustard. So if you do what dad does, I think you're going to be fine. So he came over to the house and I would get up in the morning and come down for my cup of coffee. At seven o'clock in the morning, he'd be glued to the television set, putting on a videotape of the show. He learned my mannerisms, the color of my voice. Uh, when I sat in the audience and watched, it was an out of body experience. I, I mean, it was like looking at myself on the stage. He, he was wonderful. And of course, he does add things, you know, that are his alone. He does a Christopher Walking uh, uh, invitation that I can't do. I just can't do. And I beg him to do it every year because I'm on the floor laughing. I'm his best audience for that one. So uh, that's an honor, a, a real honor to think that the show will outlast me and continue to go. I mean, my daughter Evan has said, Dad, you know, we, we'll keep it going if that's what you want. And I said, if that's what you want. That's, that's the important thing. I'm, I've had a nice run with this show. Uh, I'll be 71 in uh, uh, a few days. So, um, and I, I, I said maybe 75. I'll, 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 that'll be the curtain call. So that's uh, four more years. And uh, I, I said, nobody wants to see a 75 year old man running around the stage in tights. It'll be, it'll be a good thing just to head out. And, and you know maybe I would come back and do a few performances for the 50th anniversary and uh, um, but you know uh, um, I'm just pleased with how it's grown I know we've we've touched hearts and I know we've changed lives because in 44 years we've heard so many stories about how this play has affected people how they've become attached to it why they keep coming back every year. It's kind of like visiting an old friend over the holidays. Um, and uh, now, my goodness, I've got adults in the show who, whose kids are in the show. And I look at the adults remembering when they were kids, when we started out. Some of them weren't even born, you know. It makes me feel two days older than water. Um, but uh, we're a family. And we have been. Um, every Christmas Eve at 9 p.m., the cast goes out. We take a minute wherever we are, and we go out on our doorsteps. And we meet. And after 44 years, thousands of people are there mm -hmm. that the family does. And we hear from people all around the world who at nine o'clock for a minute or two will stop whatever they're doing on Christmas Eve and just step out because there's something special in the air, in the ether. Um, and we just, we know that we're kind of gathering together one more time and just sending a lot of love out. And then we go back and have Christmas Eve inside. And you've said, um, not only for the audiences coming back to visit an old friend, for you, it's every year, revisiting and reimagining this role is coming, you know, you're, you're meeting your old friend Scrooge that you've called him an old friend of yours. Has, had, in, in doing the show over the years, is there anything that surprises you about the character of Scrooge as it's evolved? Or is there anything about Dickens' work when you were combing through it to put together the show that kind of surprised you that you didn't discover before? Well, I, when I was teaching acting classes, I was a big uh, proponent of the inner child. Um, I think that's very important. All of us, I believe, have that inner child uh, who wants to come out and play, and particularly over the holidays. Um, Dickens did something I thought was extraordinary because when you read the book, you understand that Scrooge's first big hurt was when he's sent off to boarding school and he's left there. Now a child's greatest fear is to be left alone and uh, I think that's what be 
began to cripple Scrooge when he was young. Um, his sister comes and gets him and rescues him, and he does get to come home. But Dickens, when the ghosts come to visit Scrooge, the first ghost takes him back because we have to go back and heal the hurt child before we can leave Christmas past and move into Christmas future, see the blessings, see the lessons to be learned there. And when we've done those two things, we can walk to the edge of our own graves and look in, which is what Scrooge does. And that's his epiphany. So Dickens knew before this, you know, heal the inner child, you know, that that's what you had to do. And so, that suspension of disbelief that littles bring to the party, you know, they're so great at that. Um, we're on stage with a bunch of them every year, and I tell the adults, look, give it up, because, you know, the old adage, you're, you're on stage with kids and dogs. It's just, they're, they're going to look at these little kids. And uh, so we talk to them about acting from here as well as from here and we get together as a family we have nights where we just sit around and talk about what the show means to us uh, we laugh and we cry together and bonds are formed because of that and I, I tell uh, the cast I said if we don't laugh they're not going to laugh and if it doesn't move us to tears, they're not going to shed a tear. So they bring that priceless gift of feeling. They're, they're not acting all the time. They're actually up there feeling those emotions. And I always tell every group we have every year, if you want to know what Christmas is the essence of Christmas. There's a moment in the show that even Lawrence Olivier said you can't get in an audience of over 1,000 people where they stop moving, they stop breathing, and they hold for that release that's getting ready to happen on the stage. Olivier lived long enough for me to meet him and tell him we got that moment. <laughs> in Raleigh, North Carolina, a community theater in Raleigh, North Carolina. And it's that moment after the children gather in the center of the stage and they sing Noel and they get to the verse and they look at Scrooge who's had his change of heart and they bring him over and he's got to sing the chorus. And he's looking at these kids and he starts to sing and he can't make it he he starts to weep he puts his head in his hand and the whole company takes a step forward and they join in singing and so he can rejoin them and then it starts to snow and we sing joy to the world and I mean we're hugging when we get off the stage and it's it's a wonderful wonderful feeling uh, but that moment before Scrooge starts to sing, I, t I tell the cast, if you put your hand up, it, it'll, it'll move back because the love that rolls across that stage from 2,500 people is unbelievable. It's, it's healing. It's, it's a healing thing. And uh, I, I've gone on stage with a 104 temperature with a a pinched nerve uh, and once you pass that step from the darkness of the wings into the light on that stage it's gone it's 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 gone so um, it's a healing thing for us first of all and if we're healed then we know we can pass that along to the audience my father died for instance when I was 12 years old the last time I saw him he came into the bedroom kissed me goodnight, tucked me in. He walked out, and I used to be afraid of the dark. I would go get in the bed, 
you know, with mom and dad, and then I could fight all the monsters there were in the world. And the code word was, I would say, if I get cold tonight, let me kind of get to bed with you. And that night as he, my dad got ready to walk out of the room, I said, if I get cold tonight, I'm going to come and get in the bed with you. And he stopped in the doorway. He was backlit, so I couldn't see anything but a silhouette. He turned and looked at me for what seems like an inordinate amount of time before he spoke. And when he spoke, he said, no, son, you won't. And he walked out of my life forever. I don't know to this day if he had some sixth sense, some knowledge. Um, but he was taken to the hospital the next day. He had a brain tumor. And uh, he lived after surgery for about nine days and then passed away. So when I was working on the script, I told J.K. and Terry Mann that I wanted to write a lullaby for Bob Cratchit to sing to Tiny Tim. And I wanted it to be the words that I never heard from my dad. So we finished it about two o'clock in the morning. We had two bottles of cold duck. <laughs> and we called everybody in the universe and sang the song to them. We were laughing and crying. But anyway, every night, I get to spend a moment or two with my dad on that stage because when I see Bob Cratchit sitting on the bed side with Tiny Tim, it's me and my dad. And it's not pain free, uh, but it's a healing. And I told the lighting designer, take the lights off me and Christmas present and Jacob Marley, because we're on the other side of the stage, said, I want to be in the dark, because that's my time to look out in the audience. And one year when I looked out, there was a father, grandfather, and grandson sitting together. And while Bob Cratchit was singing, the grandfather reached around and put his hand on his son's shoulder. And then they both looked down and touched that grandchild who was sitting in the middle and I just went whoa that's Chris that's my present that's a present because they realized the gift they had while it was right there in front of them and sometimes we take those times for granted and uh, so people will say to me boy it's amazing what you do you must be dead tired when it's and I said no you got it's the most selfish thing I do. To stand on stage and get loved by 2,500 people, it's amazing, it's just amazing. And that's why when um, we have a newborn baby in the, in the company, we bring the baby on stage after the curtain call, at the end of the curtain call, and I sing the lullaby to the baby, every newborn we, we pet. And they never cried, in 44 years, they never <laughs> cried, because they feel that that love that's coming across the stage. And I feel like, man, if you got a little baby up there and they can be blessed by that feeling when they're just in swaddling clothes, it can change their lives too. So um, there are a lot of lessons I've learned in 44 years by doing the show. And that's, that's one of them, that the gift is always to the giver. Uh, yeah, so... Um, we hear from people who've seen the show. Um, it's always a day I look like Joan Crawford after a tornado and I'm in a <laughs> supermarket and somebody comes up and goes, saw Christmas come up. <laughs> but then they, you know, when they thank you and they tell you how much it, it means to them, then you, you go, Thank you, thank you, that means a lot. And for instance, we heard from a, a, a grandfather. The entire family came in a van to see the show. They went out, granddaddy got behind the wheel, everybody got in, they closed the door, and they waited for grandpa to start the van, and he just sat there. 
And finally the son said, Dad, is everything okay? And the grandpa turned and said, I have a confession to make. I've been Scrooge this year. And he said, you know what? I'm not going to be Scrooge anymore. We're going to go home and have the best Christmas we've ever had. Well, when you hear a story like that come back to you, you just go, thank you. We, you put your head on the pillow at night justified because that's what you want to do is, is change people's lives. And the medicine doesn't have to taste bad to do good things. People walk out, they feel better. They don't know exactly why, but they're better able to face the holidays, to embrace the family, and to the present, and enjoy themselves. And that's, I think that's what good theater should be doing. And I don't know too many productions of A Christmas Carol that have been endorsed by the Dickens estate. Um, I did read that you took the production overseas and that one of the uh, Dickens descendants gave his stamp of approval. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, uh, Gerald Dickens, they're, they're actually uh, uh, in, in uh, Greensboro. There was a house of mercy some years ago for AIDS patients. And I stopped into that house because we were there with a Christmas carol. And this lady came in, and I was looking at a six-foot portrait on the wall of this House of Mercy of Charles Dickens. And this woman walked in in riding boots and riding pants, very attractive woman, and she said, Oh, I see you've, you've found Charles. I said, Yes, yes. We call him Chucky D. We feel very close to this man. And I explained to her why. Well, she was the countess married to one of the great grandchildren of Charles Dickens. And uh, she had uh, sent his writing desk to High Point to be copied. And they were auctioning off this copy of Dickens' writing desk with all proceeds going to the House of Mercy. And I said, that's amazing. And she said, oh my God. She said, if Charles was alive today, this is what he would be doing. He would be giving himself and his work to causes like this. So um, when we went to England, they hosted us in a castle. I mean, it was unbelievable. Uh, quite nice and then Gerald Dickens came to Raleigh he does a one-man show of Charles Dickens reading A Christmas Carol and of course we invited him to come to the show He's a, he was a young man and uh, after the show we took him to an Irish pub here in Raleigh which was as close to an Eng English pub as we could get so we were sitting there over our pints and Finally, I couldn't stand it anymore. I said, Gerald, okay, what did you think? And he said, oh, I loved it. I thought it was marvelous. And he said, um, but there's one thing wrong that I should tell you. And I said, oh, okay, what's that? And he said, I think Charles Dickens would have wanted to play your role. <laughs> so they, they loved the liberties that we took with it um, because we, we do take liberties with uh, Mr. Dickens, but those those moments that I call the, the warm, fuzzy moments, we treat very gently and very lovingly. And for all the laughter you go through during the show, that ending will bring you back to the real message of the book. And you'll laugh, and at the end you'll shed some tears, but you'll walk out feeling like you've had a shower on the inside. So... Looking ahead a little bit after A Christmas Carol, um, in February you get to share the stage with your son um, for the upcoming season. You two are doing David Mamet's A Life in the Theater. It's a two-person show. Um, tell me, this this is a first. I know you've, your son told me when I interviewed him, um, Ira told me that you've been looking for material for a few years to do together and this was just perfect. So okay. tell me a little bit about the show and what are you looking forward to the most? Well, again, it, it, it's two actors, an older actor and a younger actor. When the play starts, the older actor's career is cresting. He's doing very well and the 
young actor is just starting out, so by the end of the play, it's kind of reversed. The old guy is on the decline and the young actor is, is beginning to blossom. It is so full of humor and love and things that Ira and I have shared together. He's got a crazy sense of humor like I do. Uh, when we read the script, it was like, it's just perfect. It's, again, it's a case of no acting. Just we go out and say these words that we say to each other all the time anyway. But, you know, being 71, you know you're closer to the end than the beginning. And the things you want to choose to do with your life become important. Um, I, I want to have memories with Ira on stage as well as off. Uh, my young six-year-old son, Thomas, same thing. He's going to be in the show in Christmas Carol this year. So uh, having those moments, and again with Evan, um, it's important, I think, before you shuffle off that coil to leave as many good memories behind you as you can. I don't know how long I have left. I would love to spend it all doing things that I love. Uh, I've just uh, 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 taken a play of mine and turned it into a book. It's going to be published December 14th. It's called The Russian Galatea. So I'm spending some time writing, um, just doing the things I love. I'm savoring life more. Um, I uh, After my heart surgery, things changed. Uh, you know, every day was a blessing. Every day was a celebration. My wife and I wake up in the morning and within 15 minutes we laugh about something. And that's blessed my life, to have someone like that to share it with. Um, so yeah, you get, you, you're just so full of these emotions, you want to pass them along. My first director was a man named Hugh Miller. He was former senior uh, director of uh, the Royal Academy in London. He was Peter O'Toole's mentor. And um, he gave uh, me so much. Uh, he cast me in the lead in the first production put on by the School of the Arts, first theater production. And um, I was in charge of writing him a thank you note. We gave him a, a gift at the end. And one of the things I said was, you have taught us and passed so many things along to us. It's now our job to pass them to the next generation. And by saying that, we're saying, you're not gonna die. You're gonna live forever. You will live forever in the hearts and souls of the next generation and the next generation because each one teaches one, and we think we can pass it down, uh, then this wonderful, incredible, crazy thing we call theater survives and begins to thrive and continues to touch hearts and change lives, and that's what it should do. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my quest right now. Somebody asked me not too long ago, What's the best line you ever said on the stage? And I said it was from Man of La Mancha when I did uh, Don Quixote. When Aldonza asks him, why do you do the things you do? His answer is, I hope to add a measure of grace to this world. I think if we need anything more than grace these days, I don't know what it is. If we have more grace in this world, if we know how to communicate better with each other, if we can push this rancor and this anger aside and listen to each other and talk with each other, not to each other, uh, we can begin to heal the world. It's what we do in theater, listening to people on the stage. That's the greatest thing you can do is listen. Um, if we can pass that along to real life situations, then we're really, we're stepping way outside of theater at that point and, and are really affecting major change in a world that's hungry for it, I think. And 
you talked about we we talked about um, Ira Evan will be here next week. Um, she's coming home and doing a concert right here at Theater in the Park. So I want to put out kind of the word about that, um, so people can get their tickets if there's still tickets available. We have a few, so um, I think we're going to absolutely sell out. It's it's wonderful that she still wants to come home, and she's so excited about it. And my gosh, we're so excited to have her. She's going to spend Thanksgiving with Dad, so that's that's a bonus, I guess. Um, but she has really blossomed with her singing. It's quite beautiful. Zane, her accompanist, is probably one of the best guitarists around. He's he's amazing, and those two together on the stage just create a special kind of magic. And she just said, "Dad, I just want to come home." It was her offer. She just called out of the blue, and I said, "Well, I think, I think we can work you in." <laughs> you know, so yeah, we're excited. Um, so I'm going to ask you to do me a, a little favor. Um, can you put on your Scrooge hat for a minute and maybe jump into character and tell our Broadway world viewers um, what they should, what they can expect from A Christmas Carol and why they should come and see you as Scrooge? Well, um, <clears throat> because if I can work my will, every idiot that goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips would be boiled in his own Christmas pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. <laughs>